almost everybody in the world is losing from the current situation. You know, it's like, that's what we have. And so we need to figure out how to coordinate to, um, you know, take them out of their capacity to extract from us and from the planet so deeply and actually support each other to survive. Um, so I feel like it's a very like profound and beautiful insight right now. Um, oh, cool, someone wrote Just Seeds is also a co-op, love it. Okay, um, so I wanna just talk, I thought I would use some housing justice examples and some other examples just to like kind of use some images and introduce us into the idea of some of the mutual aid work that's happening that inspires me. Obviously there's just like, always has been and is a million kinds of mutual aid work happening. Um, but I just will kind of bring us some stuff to the surface. So um, there's a group called Street Watch LA um, in Los Angeles that I really admire. They do a lot of direct support for people, unhoused people living in different kinds of encampments. Um, and this is a picture of um, one of their volunteers at a charging station. This is one of the things that they provide in a lot of places is a place for people to charge their phones, um, which can be a huge need for unhoused people um, to have like any ability to like do basic administrative stuff by having a, a device that's charged if they have a device. And so um, Street Watch LA provides, you know, tents and sleeping bags and water and food and all, you know, hygiene kits and all this stuff. And there's hundreds of people involved in Street Watch LA um, doing this at various sites around the, around the city. Um, and um, it's really hard, complex work in there. Um, a really inspiring group. Um, in January 2020, Streetwatch LA and a bunch of other kinds of housing justice orgs in Los Angeles were aware that the city was planning to do these raids of, um, of the uh, encampment of unhoused people living in Echo Park in Los Angeles. And so um, they got their hands on like the schedule of when they were going to send the sanitation trucks and people would go and block the sanitation trucks with their bodies. And so this is the kind of mutual aid that I find really inspiring, right? Like people literally getting between state violence and uh, members of their community. Um, and this actually worked for a while. Like the city left the Echo Park encampment alone for like a year or more um, and stopped sending the sanitation trucks to raid it. And, um, and, the, and the encampment became a, a space where a lot was happening. Like people were doing community gardening, people had set up solar showers. There's a lot of like connection and community and kind of increased safety for people there um, through getting to actually develop um, these networks of mutual aid and kind of stay in one spot. And then in March 2021, the city of Los Angeles spent over a million dollars to raid the encampment. Um, and I don't know how many, but like tons and tons and tons of people showed up to try to stop it because it was scheduled. People knew it was going to happen um, and weren't able to stop it. You can see how intensely militarized the police are. Um, I think one of the questions a lot of us have because we're seeing such an extreme crisis of um, un unhoused people um, in this brutal um, capitalist real estate economy um, that has really sharpened. I think a lot of us are asking, how would we build enough people power to actually stop these raids? Like right now, I think like in Seattle where I live, people are showing up and when the raids are scheduled and helping unhoused people pack so that they don't lose all their stuff, like their you know vital things, like their prescriptions and their glasses and their documents and trying to like do harm reduction with what this, the violence of these horrible evictions that just push people, you know, to another park or another, you know, part of the city for till that gets raided. But the real question for me also is like, how much people power can we build to actually stop the cops? And it makes me think about, maybe some of you remember this moment in July, 2019, this was publicized where all these neighbors just stopped ICE from being able to take these um, immigrants who were like at, in their own driveway in their van, like the, the neighbors just blocked it. And there's been other stories like this, like what, like what level of, what to, when we think about mutual aid today during this, this session, I want us to think both about things like giving out water and sleeping bags and charging phones and, and, you know, childcare and, you know, all of this stuff. And I also, and street medics and all those wonderful things and bail funds. Um, and I also want us to think about the part of mutual aid that's literally getting between state violence and people in our communities. And just like, how much bolder could we imagine we could be? How many more people would we need? Um, what kinds of skills would we need? And I just wanted to evoke um, in, you know, uh, 1979, this month, 1979, um, the anniversary just passed, um, people in her movement broke Asada Shakur out of prison. And, you know, I, I want us to dream really huge about what mutual aid could include, like breaking everybody out of prison. Like we, all we have is people power, but we have so many more people 
losing from these systems than winning and then guarding. But right now, obviously, we're not mobilized, right? Like we're insufficiently mobilized to win these battles when the cops spend a million dollars to raid the Echo Park. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of like, I want to evoke that much boldness in our conversation in addition to talking about the nitty gritty of um, the day-to-day -day of mutual aid work. So I want to share some background assumptions. It's fine, people, okay. Um, some background assumptions. Um, sorry, <laughs> working from home. Um, uh, that guide my work in case these are sort of just useful to understand. And I'm happy to talk about these during the Q&A, but I just think like, I'm curious also like how these relate to people um, in this session's assumptions or what you are, what, what undergirds your work in co-ops. One thing that's really important to me is that I believe that social change comes from organizing by millions of people, not from charismatic leaders, corporate media coverage, elected officials, courts, or legislatures. So what I'm saying is social change doesn't come from elites. It's like, we're not gonna be able to vote our way out of this. We're not gonna be able to sue our way out of this. Um, we're not gonna be rescued by you know, some figure. Like that's the way that you know, social movements are often narrated by in the mainstream is that it was like the vision of one person. It's like, that's not true. You know, it's always um, the coordinated work of so, 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 so many people to save each other's lives and, and you know, oppose harmful conditions. Um, and so it's just a really different theory of social change than we're really encouraged to kind of engage in like um, sanctioned dissent activities as opposed to, um, you know, deeply mobilizing, threatening activities. And I think this there's a long history of mutual aid work being criminalized, and it still is. And I think that this, these are the reasons why I think it's actually quite threatening when lots and lots of people start making the world the way they need it and want it to be. Um, one, one example I sometimes think about when I think about this point is like the Montgomery bus boycott. Like we're told to like, remember that as like a couple of famous speeches, like something Rosa Parks did and then something Martin Luther King said. Um, and in reality, of course, what the Montgomery bus boycott was, was so many working class black women coordinating rides for everyone in their community so that people could not use the buses and for so long and just the amount of like mundane, probably difficult work that was, right? Um, and just really thinking about like, that's what makes up that, that political moment, not um, the kind of flashpoints we're told to look at. And I think also most of us see that like, um, social movements do deep, deep resistance for long periods of time. And then maybe eventually there's like some kind of legislative change or something like that. And like, we're so told that's the moment when the amazing thing happened, but that's actually just like the least response that eventually the system had to do because of the power people built for so long. Like it's not, that's the system trying to write itself. That's not the thing, the, the amazing thing that happened is not that moment where that law was signed. I also believe that local networked autonomous projects grounded in local knowledges are better at responding to crisis and building methods of collective self-determination. I think this is really uh, um, vi vi uh, echoed in the solidarity economy principles I've um, read about that I think are related to this conference, but like in the US, there's like kind of nation state model people have in their minds about what it would be like to build things to scale. And it'll be like, we should have like a central thing that like tells everybody what to do, right? It's like, it's more elite and amazing to have like a nonprofit that's got like an office in DC and then it tells all the offices in other cities what to do. Um, and that's like considered to scale, right? It's, a, it's modeled on the government. And I believe that actually what it is for us to build our work to scale is to have like tons and tons and tons of people replicating each other's ideas by doing it in way, using what's useful, but also doing it in ways that make sense for this community or this neighborhood or this population and being having each other's backs and having solidarity, but actually being autonomous. And there's a lot of pieces to that. Like for example, you know, there's a long history and current reality of social movements being criminalized by our government and attacked and infiltrated. And it's much harder to take us down if we're not, if, if there isn't like a central leader or like a central committee that you can infiltrate or like have be a, um, you know, or assassinate the leaders, all those lessons learned from movements in the 60s and 70s that had more hierarchical leadership. Um, and also, um, yeah, it's that many-headed Hydra thing, right? Where it's just like, yeah, even if they take one of us down, there's so many more of us who are, who have the capacity to lead in lots of ways. Um, so yeah, that's, I think, a really central belief of mine is that like, I'm more interested in like the Black Lives Matter chapter model where it's like anyone could start a Black Lives Matter chapter and there it, there are like national conversations and resources coming down in a, you know, in a policy platform, but those chapters are all autonomous and get to figure out how to do that in their community and what it means to respond in their community um, as opposed to like 
it's an organization that tells everybody how to do this uniformly everywhere, um, which I think inevitably like misses the like the wisdom. And especially when we think about disaster, like local local wisdom is like vital for disaster response. Um, oh, oh yeah, this slide is always a little weird. Okay. Um, and I, the third thing is just that I strongly believe that starting with the survival of the most stigmatized people is the most pragmatic approach. And the reason that needs saying is because in our um, contemporary US culture, there's like a belief that if you want to fight for justice for some group of people, you should start with the people that um, people find more likable or palatable. So it's like, oh, immigrants who have no criminal record or people who are in prison, but it's they had nonviolent charges or whatever. Um, and I think that um, inevitably, you know, justice does not trickle down. It only trickles up. So if we solve problems for people at the most complex intersections of harm and vulnerability, we solve it for everybody. But if we just solve it for people who are um, in the least stigmatized, least vulnerable places who are part of that group, we won't have, it, it will not like necessarily reach the people who are like in a more complex situation. Like I always say, like if we were to be like, let's think about how to make, you know, justice for trans people. And we start with like white trans law professors, like we will not have solved it for like trans people who are in an ICE facility right now or trans people who are in prison right now or who are in psych facilities, you know, we, we won't. <laughs> like it's like, but if you solve trans people's problems there, I will inevitably like, my problems will have been solved along the way, you know? Um, so that's a kind of like a, a real different um, focus. And I think mutual aid projects most, you know, most commonly just naturally do this because mutual aid projects often pop up around catching people who are being left out of everything else, right? So that's, we can talk about that more. Um, okay, so what do I mean by mutual aid? I'm talking about the work inside our movement ecosystems. That's the work that's about helping each other with daily survival needs. and it has two other features. One, it's done from a framework of believing that the systems in place are causing the crisis, not the person in crisis. So it's a really important distinction. It's not like, oh, you're homeless. You know, what's wrong with you? You need a budgeting class. You should get sober. You should, you know, so the idea of intervening upon people in crisis to, to change them and to blame their crisis on their like flaw or something. Instead, it's like, oh no, nobody should be unhoused in this economy, like what is going on that produces um, the people being unhoused. And then the third element is that it's always comes with an invitation to collective action. It's like, if the system is the problem, then that means like people power is the solution. Like let's get to the root causes of these systems. And so, you know, oh yeah, you're here for help with eviction defense. Great. We, we're going to help you. And also, would you like to be part of organizing with other tenants or other unhoused people um, in your neighborhood or in this city or on this block or in this encampment? And you don't have to, well, well, you can have this, what we're giving out, whether or not you do, but like you're invited to like bring your wisdom and experience and become part of mobilizing to stop this and get to the root causes. Mutual Aid offers us a way to bring a lot of people into political participation that isn't just symbolic. I think that's really meaningful. Like in this, as I mentioned, like we're encouraged to do like sanctioned dissent activities. Like it's like, oh, post on social media that you care about that volunteer once a year on Thanksgiving at the soup kitchen, like go to a march once a year, like we're encouraged to do things that are primarily symbolic and often like aimed at the idea that like this will tell our elected officials to take care of things, which they are never going to do. Um, and so uh, it's like, oh no, I'm upset about what's happening to unhoused people or I'm upset about what's happening to migrants or I'm upset about you know, what's happening to old people on my block or whatever. I'm gonna like actually change those conditions right now with other people. Um, I'm going to I can like take action to be part of providing um, what is needed um, in our communities. Oh, sometimes it's really hard to advance with Google Slides. Okay. Um, the third piece is that mutual aid work builds actual safety and well-being, um, which is like it's not like we're waiting for it to be delivered. Um, and you know, we are in a time. The rest of our lives are going to be filled with just mounting disasters we've already been living through, the disasters of colonialism and capitalism and white supremacy, you know, for hundreds of years. But we also are having like this pitched experience of climate change um, and worsening wealth inequality and concentration that is producing like deadlier disaster than, you know, with each passing day. And that is just going to unfold for the rest of our lives. And so mutual aid work both like helps people survive disaster is vital, but also it prepares us for the next disaster that's coming. Like I think all the time about Hurricane Sandy when it came through New York City and 
a lot of people lost power for a long time and there was lost water access. And I think about this group CAV that had been organizing in Asian communities in the city for years. And it was CAV that knew in these buildings in Chinatown, like where there were elders on upper floors who didn't have water and couldn't get down because the elevators weren't working. Like that, like the organizing creates the, like creates the re relationships where we can literally save each other's lives. Like FEMA doesn't know that. And like FEMA is not going to show up for like a couple of weeks and then they're going to like offer like loans to homeowners. Like they're not going to like, they're not going around <laughs> buildings being like, are there elders up here who can't get down and don't have water? Like that's not like the government when they show up at disasters usually mostly brings guns and like criminalizes people. Um, and then sometimes gives very uneven disaster relief, mostly to people who have already the most resources. And even that is really crappy, like loans. Um, and so, and, you know, nothing for unhoused people or, or they're, you know, trying to clear you out of the Walmart parking lot where you now are camping because you lost your very itinerant housing from before or whatever. Um, so, so yeah, I think that uh, we should be thinking about the times we live in as a time to be doing disaster preparedness and that preparedness comes through um, organizing and knowing each other and finding out about what resources exist in our community and having the ability to share and knowing how to facilitate big meetings and, um, you know, knowing how to coordinate quickly and those kinds of things. Big important distinction is the difference between mutual aid and charity. The charity model that we uh, primarily see is the model it's based in like kind of European Christian traditions of like rich people paying alms to the poor to get into heaven it's like it's about rich people it's like about them getting to, these days like them getting good PR from saying they care about you know somebody somewhere um it's like a justification for their wealth hoarding um and generally charity models are like you can have this thing if you're the right kind of poor person or if you do the right behavior. So yeah, maybe you can get on the wait list for housing if you can be show that you're sober or if you have kids or if you, um, you know, like uh, take these budgeting classes or these parenting classes or there's like an, if you have the right immigration status, like there's an idea that there's something wrong with poor people and that's why they're poor. And so we should save the few who are good. Um, we should identify the deserving poor from the undeserving poor and get those people like do also like behavior management with them because their their poverty is a moral issue. So fundamentally, charity blames poor people for being poor instead of blaming a system that of wealth that concentrates wealth and extracts, which is what we live under capitalism, racial capitalism. Um, so charity is always system sustaining. It's like giving a, a little bit to a few people conditionally, um, whereas mutual aid is like the system is at fault. We're trying to mobilize tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people to end that system and survive along the way. Some basic mutual aid principles, as I just said, the system, not the people suffering under it is what creates poverty, crisis and vulnerability. I feel like I didn't say this clearly enough a moment ago with the mobilization, like um, the other thing is that mutual aid, like mutual aid is most people's inroad or on-ramp to social movements. We need huge social movements that can like stop pipelines and like end, you know, private property and like, I mean, you know, like de end healthcare for profit. Like we need like, you know, destroy the US military. Like we need huge social movements that can like win like big battles with heavily armed opponents, right? So we need so many more people mobilized than we have now. And mutual aid is how most people get into social movements either because something horrible is happening in their lives and they need something. And these people are giving it out and saying like, hey, come on, you know what, it's not your, we don't think it's your fault that this is happening to you. And like, do you want to join the fight? Or because people are like, oh, this thing happened to me before. Or I heard about it or I'm mad about it having my friend. I want to, and like people have this beautiful quality. Like I want to, I'm so pissed that I just heard this is happening. I want to help people. Like that's like, this, it's a very like deep human, very common first thing. It's like people want to like do something to change things and to help. And so it's how people get in and then they get into um, mutual aid groups. And then they find out that the issue is like, even more complicated than they knew. They're like, oh, I was really mad about what's happening to children at the border. And then I like started doing migrant justice work and I realized like, I care about adults too. And also it turns out, wow, like black migrants have like different obstacles than everyone else and are targeted in a certain way in the system. And wow, what's happening to migrants with disabilities when they're in these horrible detention centers? And wow, what, what's it like for queer and trans migrants? And like just people's solidarities grow when they do, when they actually like do the material work of mutual aid because you learn the greater complexity of the issue beyond like whatever one single you know story you'd heard or what what happened just what happened to you and then you're more and more able to show up and have 
everyone's backs, right? So like what I'm imagining here, which I think really relates to the visions um, happening inside the NASCO community is like, maybe I'm deep inside like uh, eviction defense mutual aid project or a court support mutual aid project or a childcare collective. Like I'm deep, deep inside a particular thing. I'm in the weeds. We are like, you know, really doing this work day to day. We know a lot in detail about these needs or this system or this neighborhood or whatever. But we also are tied to, oh, what are the, what's the transit riders union doing? We better go have their backs. And oh, what's happening with the fight to defund the police? Yeah, we're going to show up at City Hall for that. Like we, are, we become people who are having each other's backs so hardcore, even if we're deep inside our part piece of the work, that there that all of us are everywhere on some level and we become really unbeatable. You know, like we enough of us are showing up when the city's doing the sweep of the homeless thing, even though what I'm mainly working on is the abortion fund. I also show up at the sweep thing and like help stop the sweep, you know, like that that level of um of mobilization is what we need if we're gonna start to win more. And I'll just be real with you, we're not winning right now, you know, on any of these fronts. We're like barely barely able to just even try to help a few people have a little less suffering. Um, mutual aid is really based on the idea of commitment to dignity and self-determination for people in need or crisis. Like, you know, that people who are, the charity is based on the idea that people who are in crisis need to be intervened upon and fixed. And mutual aid is based on the idea that people who are in need or crisis actually have deep wisdom about the crisis and they know what they need. And so it's a very different like framework around um, dignity. Um, mutual aid projects are about people digging in long term. It's not like, oh, I show up once a year for the Women's March, or oh, I come out for just this day of the year when this, you know, this thing is com is commemorated or something. It's like, no, we're gonna we're gonna hang out in housing court <laughs> in our town, and we are gonna like figure out how housing court works, and we're gonna be like, okay, it turns out we should be there on Wednesdays. Okay, what we need to have our materials be in Spanish and Vietnamese. Okay, we like we're gonna like spend like years developing this project to figure out how this mutual aid project can be more useful, more relevant, responsive to conditions that are changing. How are we going to draft more people into it? Like we're like, we're sticking with this like for a long time. Um, mutual aid projects really need to have pathways for new people to join. This is something that a lot of groups I work with are struggling with. Um, one common um, stumbling block is that like three of us start a mutual aid project and we never really figure out how to share like our institutional knowledge and skills with more people. We, we are so busy doing the work, we don't recruit new people and orient them and make them into decision makers and then we burn out. So like, we're trying to make like giant movements that can like save everyone's lives and like confront big systems and be really bold. And so we need to let a lot of new people in. We need to be a space where you could show up and not use the right words yet or not know that much about this and where we still can um, like welcome you and you can become part of it and like grow your solidarities. Um, the only time this isn't true is like some of us are doing like mutual aid work that's illegal. You know, we're doing mutual aid work, getting people healthcare that they're not supposed to get or um, supporting people. Um, to have something that the government has criminalized or whatever. So sometimes there's you do need security around some parts of some mutual aid projects, but most mutual aid projects um, can really be these on ramps, you know. Um, as I mentioned, mutual aid projects organically produce political ed because you show up and you learn more about the problem and its complexities and all the people affected by it than you knew when you started out because everything is, you know, bottomlessly complex. And so you grow new solidarities and also a lot of, so it happens organically, like, oh, we're sitting at the charging station all day. We start talking about why we're there and what homelessness is. And then we like, you know, we have a really interesting conversation or debate about whole parts of it and learn about each other's take, you know, like that there's deep relationship building and solidarity building just when you're doing like the day-to-day -day mundane mutual aid work together. Um, and, you know, someone comes to the table and they say these things and I'm more like have a conversation with them about that. It's like, whoa, what's that? Um, and then the other thing is that a lot of mutual aid groups intentionally do political ed. We're like, oh, we're going to have a disability justice training, or we're going to have, we're going to all watch this documentary to learn about kind of the history of this type of mutual aid work as it was done in this movement. Or we're going to like all have a night where we discuss like how our work in housing court relates to what's happening in Palestine or in, you know, whatever space that we're wanting to like see the political connections. Um, uh, so that, you know, piece of mutual aid is really significant. It's like we are developing greater and greater solidarity as opposed to what I would consider like what nonprofits mostly do, which is like be really siloed. And like there's an incentive inside nonprofit world to not be multi-issue because you'll get more funding if you 
like stick to your thing. It's like, oh, well, yeah, we, we do this youth services work, but we don't want to take a stand against the, the plan to build a new youth jail in town because we don't want the county to take away our grant or like not favor us, you know, or um, we do this gay rights work, but we don't want to like come out too hard on abortion because we, you know, we don't want the political flag from that. So there's a kind of like nonprofits are about containing our movements and like limiting their scope. And that's because nonprofits are paid for by our opponents, right? Like the government and rich people are who fund nonprofits. Um, so they're designed to limit the horizons of our work and mutual aid projects are mostly nobody's getting paid, which is of course the history of all social movements in the world is that nobody got paid, um, right? The poorest people with the most skin in the game and at least to lose just relentlessly supported each other and <laughs> fought like enormous um, odds to uh, to try to change the conditions. Um, so yeah, this, this idea of like every connecting everything and building out the solidarity, like that makes perfect sense if you're, if, if unless you're in the, unless you have these disincentives that come from funding. Um, in mutual aid projects, there's a lot of work people are doing to address like the fact that if we're coming from capitalist, white supremacist, um, patriarchal, ableist societies, colonial societies that have made us not have some really like fundamental social relational skills that we need to actually work in groups. And so part of that is like, how do we become people who can give and receive feedback? We live in a prison society that makes it really dangerous to ever give or receive feedback. It's like, everything's really high stakes. It's like with harm, we either like totally minimize it and we're like, you know, that didn't happen, nothing's going on. Or we're like, you're the worst person in the world. You're going behind bars for the rest of your life. And we have a very hard time finding this middle space of like, you know, um, oh, I, you, something I'm doing impacts you. You'd like me to change it. Okay, I'm gonna think about that, right? Or like, I'm able to tell you the impact you're having on me because I'm not scared that you're gonna like be super defensive because it's so scary to receive feedback. So the skill of being able to give and receive feedback um, is a really hard one that we really need when we're collaborating with each other and on anything that matters to us. Um, and that's something I see people really working hard to build inside mutual aid projects, as well as um, work to build um, conflict resolution skills and processes, like both conflict prevention through actually like giving each other feedback instead of like stuffing and stuffing and stuffing until I explode and like, you know, have a huge conflict and destroy the organization. But also after harm has happened, like how do we repair? Like, you know, our society has a policing and prison system that is not about repair at all. It's about punishment solely. Um, so instead, like, what do we need to build to people who are like not afraid of conflict or like, oh yeah, conflict will happen whenever we do stuff that we care about with other people. So it doesn't mean anybody's bad and let's like be able to move towards it. There's a lot of really great new resources out about um, conflict in groups that I, um, I think I'll put some in the chat um, after I give this talk, but um, there's just like a lot coming out from abolitionist movements about how to do conflict in groups and in relationships. And um, it's so incredibly helpful. Um, there's actually a workshop coming up this Thursday that Miriam Kaba and others are putting on, I think through the Interrupting Criminalization Project that's coming up on Thursday the 18th. I think at 4 p.m. Pacific um, about conflict inside organizations. I bet that would be of use to a lot of people at this conference. I know I'm really excited about it. And um, it's part of a toolkit she's coming out with uh, soon called In This Together that I recommend. Um, mutual aid projects really care about transparency. I think that probably really relates to the values people are talking about at this conference. You know, um, nonprofits and charities don't have transparency. It's like, oh, the white guy at the top gets paid five times what the receptionist gets paid who's a woman of color or like, we don't really know where the money came from and it's actually coming from this creepy corporation or like whatever, whereas mutual aid projects, you know, you see this a lot on people's social media and stuff. Like we're, we're like posting that we like, we, can, we took in this much money from Venmo and from our fundraiser and then we've spent, bought this many sleeping bags. Like people are just really like value transparency and it's like essential to, to make sure that we, like this, this project belongs to everybody who's part of it. Um, and I think I'm super curious to talk to you guys about consensus-based decision-making. I think that there's a huge trend towards consensus um, in mutual aid projects um, over the last several decades, especially because of lessons learned from 1960s and 70s movements where there was a lot of hierarchy and it created um, both like reproduction of things like toxic masculinity and sexism and racism and stuff. And it also meant that there, it was really easy for government infiltrators to disrupt the work. Um, 
and uh, destroy the work. And so I think people increasingly, um, and also the, the, you know, the realization that majority rule is so problematic because it just means that like, if there's 10 of us in this group and seven of us, you know, don't have mobility-based disabilities, we can just outvote the three who do and say, we, we don't care about that. We're going to the place with stairs or whatever. And then those people are just gonna leave our group, <laughs> you know? Like we don't actually want to outvote each other. We want to create proposals that everybody can live with, even if it's not your favorite. And that like actually resolve concerns because we're trying to keep people. It's not like a job where we're like, well, we don't care if you, if you don't like it, you still have to do it because you have to, or else you'll be fired, right? Like nobody's getting paid mostly. So like, we actually want to keep people and we want to keep their wisdom. We don't just want to like, we don't want to win votes. We want to like have the most wise proposal move forward <laughs> that actually includes everyone's um, questions and concerns instead of just steamrolling them. I think there's a skill that we're all building and doing consensus-based work, which is very unlikely skill in our, in our society, which is a skill of desiring other people's participation. So like, instead of bringing my proposal to the meeting and being like, I'm gonna get my proposal through and I'm gonna win, I'm like, I hope people tell me what doesn't work for them about this so that the proposal gets better. Like, I can't wait to find out that, like, what I didn't think of. Like, that is so, like not needing to be right, but instead wanting, to see like the work bloom in the way that is most beneficial to like our shared purpose and assuming that there's more wisdom in the group than there is in any one person. Um, and so that it's not offensive or scary to have someone be like, oh, Dean, you didn't think of this or I'm worried about this part of your proposal. It's like, oh, cool, you know. A couple of things, this conversation comes up a lot. A lot of people I talked to during, especially the first few months of the COVID pandemic were kind of like, but isn't, isn't, isn't the vaccine the reason we need a government? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like this conversation a lot, like, like, oh no, like we, disaster is, is the disaster pandemic is the moment where we see that we really do need government relief. And I just really want to question that. I think that government relief, um, that belief is a fantasy that we will have a caregiving state that will actually ever deliver relief that way. And every disaster, Hurricane Katrina, the pandemic, I mean, you know, every wildfire, I think we see again and again, like the reality of the United States government, every time there is a disaster, whatever constitutes relief is like heavily racialized and gendered and classed is an opportunity for like somehow a bunch of rich people to get way richer. Like I'm thinking about the, like the COVID, like, you know, that they gave out, um, that they gave out COVID relief through giving small businesses these like loans that became grants giving businesses that so that like huge corporations got like just tons of slush money and if you're a, a person who's having a crisis because you can't work because of covid you have to somehow like instead of the government just giving you money to live your organization has to figure out how to get all this money which of course left out like black and immigrant businesses very intensely right so like more businesses that had more formal infrastructure were much more able to claim this money and then maybe somehow through that you get something but like it just was the most inefficient like ridiculous way to deal with the fact that people couldn't go to work because of covid um and it, it had these incredibly like wealth concentrating results right and we just see this again and again um that ultimately like government poor and disaster relief just reaffirms like settler values of white supremacy and um, and sexism. And, and I, I, my, my background is that I, you know, I, I'm a poverty lawyer and I, I study social welfare systems and I try to fight for people's benefits in them. And it's just like the whole history of social welfare systems in the United States and also elsewhere, but especially in the United States is that like, you know, they're designed to, as I mentioned, like control poor people. So it's like, if you're going to have a bunch of, you're always going to have a bunch of people who are displaced from the economy because the economy is based on extraction and you need a lot of like unemployed people in order to keep wages low. And, you know, you have to have lots of throwaway people in a society that's based on white supremacy and capitalism. You need to control those people from not, up, you know, having uprisings. And so you create these systems of relief that like expand a little bit when people are, are, are rising up and then they quick, quickly shrink, right? This is the history of the U.S. Uh, welfare state. Um, and so these 
systems, the benefits they give out are always like stigmatizing. They're always excluding lots of people. Like you can't get these benefits because you're undocumented. You can't get these benefits because you don't have an address. You can't, you know, what all of you can get these benefits because you have a criminal record. Um, and then they're easily revoked. Like that's the thing about government relief. It's like, uh oh, we're worried people aren't going back to work. We're ending unemployment extensions or we're ending stimulus checks, even though people are just as broke as ever. And there's more and more people living outside. Like it's not it's a system designed to just maintain the extraction machine. It is not designed for people's welfare and it never has been, right? We live under a colonial government. And so the idea that this will become a caregiving state, um, I think is outrageous. And I mentioned the question of scale. I think it's really important. I mean, we people talk about this a lot with the pandemic, like, oh, but we would never be able to respond to the pandemic without the government. Okay, we saw what the government did, like how, men, how much death, and then in particular, how much black and Latinx death and prisoner death came from the way the government responded to COVID. And, and how much of that is about our government having a commitment to a healthcare for profit system that ensures that pe so many people will have medical neglect. I believe that we could create, we could absolutely without a, a, you know enforced capitalist white supremacist system, we could do a better job creating and distributing medicine. Right now, the reason people all over the world cannot get the vaccine is because of healthcare for profit. So the idea that, the current system like helps us during disaster. Um, uh, it, it just it's I, I just think it's so misguided and it also misses the mark of like the fact that people would collaborate to make things like a vaccine without a profit motive. Like we would because we actually like want to live, you know. Um, I think it's important. I'll just say like um, you know when we're struggling in our movements, I think absolutely we can be like we can celebrate concessions when they happen. Like we can be like, wow, it is great that people started talking about a universal basic income at the beginning of, um, of, the, of the pandemic. Like it's, it, we can be like, oh, wow, that, there's like some possible, like rupture, rupture, ruptures happen with disaster and there's political possibility or we could be like surprised and delighted that like there's some kind of like something, we win something like we win a little bit of defunding of the police. While we can also be like, that doesn't mean that the system is fair. It just, it's like proportional to our political power and to the power of the disruption that we're threatening. And we have to like continue to fight to actually win what we want because all everything they offer is like a tiny concession that's meant to right the ship. It's not actually meant to resolve our dilemmas. Their ultimate goal is to maintain the extraction machine, which is what, in my opinion, the state is like as long as possible, right? And 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 they're all, and to to the peril of all of us. And so um, so we can both like celebrate when our uprisings or our organizing produces a little bit of um, concessions, but not mistake the concessions for like the answer to our problems. Obviously, I think the stakes are really high. You know, we're um, we're not surviving this and we're not winning right now. I mean, I just, I'll say like, I really struggle with people like, you know, really worshiping like these, you know, few people in Congress who are supposedly progressive. It's like, I'm, you know, I, of course it's refreshing to see some of these people exist there but they're losing. Like we, I mean, we, and like, yeah we don't have Trump as president anymore. We have Biden who is on schedule to be the most deporting president ever. Like right now it's Obama, but it'll be Biden. Like the, like, the people, the Democratic Party, the like, there, you know, the Green New Deal is not passing, Medicare for all is not happening, Biden is against, like, it's like, we are, we, we are not winning through that system, like the, the endless fantasy that will take over the government is so limited for me, both because of my perspective about what the US government is as a racial and colonial project, but also like, it's not happening, like what's happening is like disasters unfolding all around us, and we need to, and I'm, you know, I'm interested in the experiments people are doing with local politics, and I cared a lot about watching, you know, like I care, you know, I'm, I'm, I care a lot about the defund efforts in our city councils to, to defund the police and to create solidarity budgets that fund things people actually need. I do that work. I care about that work. I, I care about trying to sometimes do local election stuff that might like make that work happen a little bit better or like prevent it from being undone by terrible elected officials, which just happened in Seattle. We all of our abolitionists lost uh, and we are having, you know, new people come into office who are going to really try to undo the like the little gains we've had in um, in the police budget shrinking. Um, but I don't mistake that for thinking the answers are going to come out of that process. Like we need to do that work. Like we have to contend with the systems that exist, but like we do that work very differently when we think that those systems are going to deliver the goods when it's like, those people can just buy the elections anytime. <laughs> like it's not set up, you know? Anyway, um, we can talk more about that if you guys want, obviously coming to this from like an anarchist perspective. Um,
just a few final images. Um, as, as I'm sure some of you know, in the summer of 2020, when the uprising started, um, people fought the cops in Seattle on the streets. And the, um, at this one precinct in my neighborhood, the cops left the precinct and it became a police free zone right around there. And so these are some images from that, which, you know, um, this is just a bunch of mutual aid stands. I, I just think it's interesting that mutual aid is the physical infrastructure of those kinds of people's occupations. Like when you go there, what you see there is just mutual aid tents, right? So they, you know, I love the no, no cop co-op. Um, this is an image of that park that's right near that precinct. So the top part of the image, you can see people living in tents in the park, which of course would never be allowed when the cops were there and people doing community gardens, which would never be allowed when the cops were there. And the bottom part on the play field, you can see the kind of square tents around the edges. And those are all mutual aid tents. People are giving out food. You could get your hair cut. You could get mental health support. You could get your nails done. You could get clothes, you know, water or whatever. People were giving out all kinds of great stuff and just hanging out in the field a lot. And I met a lot of people. I was mostly what I was doing at that time was um, flyering. We'd created like a mental health support line because a lot of people were like really, you know, had been through really traumatic things with the cops on the streets and we're just kind of like losing it um, and just having a really hard time because this is a very disruptive moment. Um, and we were trying to do kind of like crisis support and crisis prevention. So I was flyering, going around the field constantly, just talking to different people. And I met so many people who were like, yeah, I drove here from Idaho. This is, I'm, I drove here to join the movement. I've never been part of anything before. You know, like so many people who were newly mobilized and their first contact when they arrive at this place, there's no like welcome. It's like, the, it's, it's mutual aid tent. Like the first person who talks to you is somebody who's like, hey, you want a quesadilla? Hey, do you want a bottle of water? Like. Mutual aid is the entry point. And I just can't express how important it is that when we are doing it, we know that, that we actually like, okay, how am I welcoming people? How are we creating, how are we drawing them in? And I saw people again and again, what they wanted to do was get their hands dirty. Like some people were putting up like a really giant metal sculpture of, of a fist, like a black power fist. And people were so excited to like join that project or to like, like people want something to do you know, um, when they enter this kind of political space, like they've come like with their heart on fire, like ready to join. And so we need to give people like entry point, like things to join, you know, like that is, I think like the, like the, the task. Um, so then, um, the police actually took their precinct back eventually, but there, but, um, a set of unhoused people kept living in one part of that park. And then in, um, December, 2020, the Seattle Police Department announced they were going to raid and sweep the park. And so then people did this beautiful mutual aid project of trying to stop it. They created these barricades all around that part of the park. These are more of the barricades. Um, and then, of course, the city spent over a million dollars raiding the park and occupying the park for a long time. And I mean, just so devastating. So just, again, the same story that we're seeing. What would it take for us to block that? Similar work happening in Philadelphia that I just wanted to, to name in the summer of 2020, people doing occupation. Um, demanding that these various vacant units of, of housing um, that the city of Philadelphia owned be um, given up. They actually won, um, they won 50 units, which is pretty amazing and their, their fight is ongoing. Um, and I also wanted to draw attention to this other housing struggle, um, people in Oakland, um, these black moms who um, occupied this vacant housing. And then you can see in this picture on the upper left, like their allies like standing outside guarding it at night and similar things happening in Los Angeles and a lot of places people squatting reminds me of the um you know uh around the 2008 2009 2010 um uh, very similar free the land work that was happening all over people were um were squatting um foreclosed housing and putting unhoused people in it um maybe some people remember that work was that called free the land or now I'm questioning myself anyway um but then of course look at this militarized police response that comes to clear out those black families so not surprising um okay i'm really excited to have a conversation with all of you and to see what's been going on in the chat um oh great here's the here are some questions maybe i'll just start with these questions that are um in the q a bob asks how do we change that culture in nonprofits to silo and try working together yeah okay i guess what i would say about nonprofits is like i don't i don't think it's about the people who go and work in them. Like, I mean, obviously I've worked in nonprofits extensively. Um, it's this, it's the incentives of the structure. So some of it is just actually structural. So, there, you know, I've spent a lot of my life 
uh, trying to help different nonprofits become collectives and become horizontal and pay people equally and, you know, build out ways of making decision making that involve big communities instead of just like an ED and a board or whatever. So I think there's ways we can try to make interventions in the nonprofit structure, but fundamentally what a nonprofit is, is something that is funded by either the government or philanthropy and sometimes grassroots fundraising, but mostly it's the government or philanthropy. And so the result is that like its horizons are just limited in that way. There's a really great book I want to recommend called The Revolution Will Not Be Funded by um, edited by Insight that I think is kind of like for a lot of us, like a core text for um, for uh, thinking about this. But so I think we can try to change cultures and nonprofits, but also it's just like what we the, we need. We need so much more mutual aid and support than nonprofits will ever provide. Like, like, you know, it's like, I'm in the world of poverty lawyering. It's like, there's just a little bit of legal services. It's like, you know, there's a, there's a couple organizations and they do immigration support or they do support to people facing eviction, but they can only take a few cases compared to the huge number of people who need that. And they take the ones with the people who have the best case, meaning the ones of people who are not the most stigmatized or vulnerable or in the worst situation. And like, it's designed that way. It's like a little, it's like a little uh, bottleneck, you know? And those services, like all charity services, were invented to contain people. Legal services, legal aid was invented in the Lower East Side, um, like the turn of the century when there was all these, um, you know, European immigrants coming um, into New York City and they were organizing about their tenement apartments and about the conditions in these terrible factories they worked in, garment factories and whatever. And then like, uh, they were they were doing like deep collective organizing and the idea was no we want them to funnel their individual cases into the legal system like almost as a way to like assimilate them in and like break up their people power like that's why legal aid was invented like not you know what I mean like it's a terrible way to do to try to take care of tenant needs to like put them through the like you know capitalist court system absolutely not going to work right our workers needs so I think that like the way I think about the question of, of a nonprofit is like, these are the incentives for it to be this way. That's mainly how it's gonna be. Nonprofits are very like bad at responding to actual immediate disasters for the most part, because they have like a work plan and they just stick to that or, and they're they're very siloed. And, and so we can, we who are working in nonprofits can try to like take them over, make them horizontalist, try to connect them to actual social movement work, which is mostly not what they are connected to. We can do that stuff. They can be a tactic or like a tool in our toolbox that we use, but the movement will never be coming from nonprofits, nor should it, because then that would mean that it actually belongs to our opposition because they own the nonprofits. And we can try to move towards grassroots fundraising instead of philanthropic giving and government grants because that makes it somewhat more autonomous. But like, no matter what, like our move, they need to be a tiny part of a huge set of movements in, in which most people are doing movement work unpaid because we just need like so many more people doing everything than could ever be paid through nonprofits, if that makes sense. Um, Bob also asks, how do we move forward with consensus if an infiltrator is trying to disrupt our process? Um, I think that groups do a lot of different things with this. Um, sometimes, when people know that someone's an infiltrator, they just ask them to leave, <laughs> you know, like it's okay to do that. Um, I think sometimes groups have more complex conflict happening where it's not somebody who's necessarily like an infiltrator who's a cop, but like just, you know, people are having like social problems with each other, like that make it feel good to disrupt the process where I'm like, I'm so mad at the other people in this group that I'm gonna like not let any decisions going forward. And I think that, um, I mean, this is like maybe too complex to address here, but I think that, you know, I work with a lot of groups who are in those kinds of situations where it's like, okay, well, what was the, what was the conflict that led people to be dug in like this and to no longer be able to center our shared purpose. And instead I'm centering like my grudge or my feeling my hurt feeling. And so I'm going to just try to like block and shut down this group's work. Um, and so we do a lot of different kinds of, it can be about mediation between particular people. It can be about doing a bunch of workshops about group culture and decision-making to try to recenter our purpose. It can be about um, needing to like talk about how this conflict is affecting everyone in the group. Like most people who are in conflict who are doing that kind of behavior, they have a reason and they don't think they're being destructive. You know, they think they're being, they're, they're deeply protecting something that's hurt or they're, um, they think they're fighting for justice. So like figuring out how to open all that up, like what would it take for this person to feel fully heard about the thing that happened to them that they're so mad about that makes them want to kind of throw a wrench in all the work or what, what do they think it's about? Or what, do, what have others not understood about what's happening for this person? You know, so I think a lot of it is about 
re like restoring relationships, um, you know, doing conflict resolution work. Um, Bob also asks, are we past the tipping point as far as being able to build our movement in, um, in time to change things? Are we stuck with what we have because of the entrenched culture supporting capitalism in our country? Bob, that's a really the question. Um, I guess I would say, um, I don't know whether our movements can pull it together given the clock of climate change. And I, that like, I feel, some people are like, oh, wow, that sounds so hopeless, Dean. I'm like, it's just a question of like, what do I want to spend the rest of my life doing? Like, I, yeah, none of us know what's going to happen. It's pretty fucking bleak, you know? And I want to spend the rest of my life fighting like hell for the survival of as many people as possible and to destroy the things that are extracting from us and hurting us and killing people I love, you know, like we do, there's no guarantees. I think, um, I definitely don't think that capitalism is inevitable. I think most people are losing and that is a reason to, to believe we can win change. And there's a lot of really tricky, smart things that make people buy into stuff that's actually hurting them, right? Like that's what, you know, systems of racism and patriarchy and all these things like keep people really dug into stuff that's actually hurting them. And so it's just about like, how do we become like really relentless and savvy about bringing more and more people into our thinking about meeting people where they're at and talking to them about the things that really concern them, getting them mobilized about something they do feel like they have skin in the game about and then seeing how we can build solidarity from there. Like just basic organizing, like that's what we need. We And people are very isolated right now, very, um, atomized in this society, like more people live alone than have ever before. You know, there's just, there's ways in which all of that makes us more vulnerable to the spells that, that we're put under that are pacifying and really dangerous. And so we need to like, and then at the moments, I feel like when you see moments like the pandemic where a lot of people are just like, wait a minute, what the fuck? Like, this is bullshit. You know, like you're like, oh yeah, good. Okay. These are, I mean, we're just going to keep living through ruptures and disasters that give people unfortunately, like a real chance to be like, to reevaluate whether or not the current system is in their interest because they are gonna be losing a lot fast and seeing a lot of like outrageous um, injustice in their own lives and the lives people they care about. So I think, I think the system is incredibly fragile and that's why it has to be so well armed. Um, and at the same time, it's smart and we have a lot to do to, to shift towards mobilization. Rue says, my co-op is working to create a staff collective model. What are your suggestions for this process in regard to mutual aid principles and restorative practices? That's awesome, Rue. Yeah, um, I don't know if it's useful. The, there's an organization that I founded like 20 years ago called the Sylvia Rivera Law Project. And we have operated as a collective and do have um, staffing. Like the org has been like, you know, had at most seven staff at, at times and then had a broader set of people in the collective. And I, I really believe in that approach of like having governance, not just through staff, although some groups just collectivize their staff. Um, and some, we have some stuff about that history and those efforts on the SRLP website in case that's useful. And I've written some stuff that's also available. Um, I mean, I think that some of the things that are useful. I, I, I mean, I really believe skilling people up in an org about, about like um, conflict prevention and resolution. So like using some of these tools, there's a, um, there is a workbook. Let me just see if I can quickly pull it up. I think it's called moving toward, um, sorry. Um, it is a new workbook called turning toward each other. I'm going to put the link in the chat in a sec. Um, that has been really useful. Like I've worked through that with groups where we, we uh, you know, spend time like discussing those, um, those ideas, like basically just like, how do we move people towards having skills? And then I do a lot of like workshops for people. Um, I'm doing actually some of them coming up. Um, let me just give the link to that too. Uh, through the Barnard Center for Research on Women. And I've done some that you can watch the videos of that are um, about things like, how do we have conversations that are generative about capacity in our group? How do we have conversations, things people fight about? How do we have, how do we learn how to do feedback and what good feedback is? How, you know, just building people's like people skills. And I think that a lot of groups ignore that. We're very oriented in capitalism towards like, what does our group put out? Like how many groceries did we deliver or how many whatever, you know, conferences do we have? And we really just neglect like, what's it like in here? And that is the, what's it like in here is like what makes or breaks all the work. And um, if we're practicing 
um, dominant culture principles and behaviors inside the group, the work is probably corrupt, right? So like, how do we um, like really give enough like energy and care to how we're treating each other um, and to building disability justice principles into how we organize our work and all of these pieces um, while we do the work. And I think it's just really easy to neglect, especially like if it's a if it's paid work because that work feels like it's the uncompensated work, which is of course the nature of like living in a society that doesn't compensate emotional labor or like wants to build social relations that are just about domination. So I think that's like probably the main thing I would say is like how to put enough care into that part. And then I think there are a lot of really good tools out there. Um, you know, there's another like um, a workbook that Miriam Kaba put out called like reparative conversations. There's just a lot of stuff about this coming out right now. Um, that's really helpful. I would recommend that website transformharm.org. Um, I'll put that in the chat. There's a lot on there. Oops, that's .org. Um, yeah, just thinking about like what are some of the tools that would skill people up because there will be conflict and and that also like most of us have never been in organizations that were horizontal right we're all like in school and in our family and in a church and it's like all of it's in a job and it's all like we're all trained to kind of take on one of two roles like I'm going to dominate and I'm going to like see, see how I can make my thing get through or I have to go along to get along like I have to try to not get in trouble I have to like pretend I agree with this like so most of us um, need a lot of support to become people who like actually participate when it's time to give our opinions, but also don't over participate and dominate. Like we just tend to only know how to go to those two extremes because those are the like easiest ways to survive in the kinds of organizations and um, spaces that we're usually in. I think also I, I work a lot with groups just to like pay attention to organizational culture, like just like what's it like in here? Like, what's the vibe? Like, is it, is it rushed? Is it like, you know, um, do we celebrate? Is it caring? H are we accountable? What happens when someone doesn't do something they said they do? How do we talk about that? Or do we just like pretend it didn't happen or someone just does it for them? I mean, like, how do we kind of like surface? Like, the, the conflict is often along the same fault lines again and again, stuff like you don't do your job and I do it for you. It's like a really common conflict inside um, organizations and then, you know, a danger in horizontal organizations or I'm supposed to do a job and I don't know how to do it, but I don't want to tell anybody or, um, uh, you know, we're, we're forming a clique and like we all talk about how annoying you are behind your back. Like, you know, how do we move people away from a culture of gossip towards a culture of direct feedback? I mean, just like, it's just the same stuff over and over again. Um, and so that's, I think, a lot of what I, what I work with groups that are trying to um, make a collective model, either out of a group where everyone's unpaid or where some people are paid. I think with the paid groups too, it's really useful just again, like having a really clear work plan for each team, having a clear work plan for each staff person so that they know what they're supposed to do and they know how to identify if they don't know how to do it or if the job has too many things for them to do, like within the amount of time they have and that other people can say, oh yeah, like we know what that person's supposed to do here. And so there's a sense of transparency and accountability and like, um, and then having like a way of evaluating people. Like um, I think I published, a, and maybe I can try to pull it, put it in the chat before I go, but um, like I published something about like the way that we for a while were doing the SRLP evaluations where it was like, you know, it's, it's my turn to be evaluated. Maybe we were doing one a month, my turn to be evaluated. Everybody in the collective can fill out this evaluation form about me. That's kind of like, these are the things that, you know, these are the parts of Dean's job. How's he doing with this? How's he doing with that? And, you know, um, uh, where are places where you see Dean needing support? What are things that you think are really great about what Dean does? And then, you know, uh, there'd be like three of us and like, we would digest all of that. And we wouldn't give the people those sheets. We would just kind of pull out like, what are these, like, what are the top things people love about what you're doing? And what are like sort of three areas of growth? And we would have like an hour long conversation and we would do that, you know, once every three or six months for new employees and then once a year for other people. And um, I really saw people actually grow because I think it's like, it was like you heard, it was very measured. Like you heard about what you were doing well and what your areas of growth were in a conversation that you knew was gonna happen. So like, we all need to be able to give and receive feedback on the fly too, but there was something really nice about this kind of like, and it's happening for everybody. It's not like, oh, just, you know, uh, it just comes from your boss to you and you just, it's all high stakes, like the way feedback is in like hierarchical jobs. Um, NASCO Porch asks, what advice do you have for avoiding burnout sustainability, especially when the work seems to get more and more challenging? Yeah. I mean, I think about this so much with friends who are doing the sweeps work, you know, there's like seven people in Seattle who are like showing up at all the sweeps and trying to help people pack. Like that's not sustainable. That's so incredibly, um, 
that work is so devastating, so difficult. People who are already in crisis and living outside, then having another eviction, you know, it's just, I, and so many of us are doing that kind of work or supporting people in prison who are under like brutal conditions or supporting people facing deportation or, you know, facing poverty, et cetera. So it's just like, how do we, how do we make the work sustainable? One thing is that I feel like the word burnout is used a lot, but it's pretty vague. So I really encourage people with themselves and in groups to talk a lot with each other about like, what do we mean by it? Like, are we saying, like one way I think people use the word burnout is like, there was conflict in my group and I feel burned and I can't go back and I hate this movement. And I'm, you know, like this kind I feel like yucky and dead about doing any of this work. Like conflict-based burnout is a particular thing. And then our set of questions are like, wow, like what happened? What is there a possibility for repair? Like sort of all of those tools. There's also the burnout of like, oh my God, we have seven people and we are like all over the map of the city and we have so many things we're doing. Do we need us to, to like put more energy towards getting more people in this group, <laughs> you know? So that, or do we need to just limit some of our activities? Like, okay, we can only do this for this neighborhood or okay, we can only do this. Like we can only do four, four of these a month. We can't keep doing as many as anyone asks for. Like just some level of like, is it a capacity question? And for most of us, there's some weird stuff underneath capacity questions because of like internalized capitalism. Like a lot of us can't say no, or we're like um, a lot of us, I think a lot of people who are in our movements doing a lot of this work, like we're essentially like addicted to work. Like we feel deeply inadequate and we feel like we have to do more and more and more and more to deserve we exist. Maybe we are from families in which there was crisis and chaos that we couldn't control. And so we are, we're on this like, path internally where it's like, I'm going to try to control and support every crisis I come up against and see if I can heal myself. It's like a deep, um, you know, sort of subterranean messaging. There's just like a lot of emotional stuff under capacity and overwork questions. I have found a lot of use in the 12 step program, Workaholics Anonymous. It is not perfect. There's limits to 12 step programs, but it's just, there is actually a lot of wisdom in there about like sort of digging around and like, what is motivating me to be somebody who overcommits? Um, what kinds of messages do I believe about myself? And the program, the 12 step program doesn't, you know, use a politicized framework for that. But I think those of us who are anti-capitalist, anti-racist and stuff can like kind of see that these are like cultural messages. Um, I find that useful, but yeah, like figuring out like how, and I just did that workshop at Barnard, which you can watch the video where we talked, I talked a lot about like how to have a conversation in your group, in your co-op or in your mutual aid group about culture and capacity and normalize that a lot of us have these internal messages happening and then talk about how to move together in ways that where we don't overcommit so severely and where we try to bite off like an amount of work we can do. But I think a lot of this is about like making these groups bigger. <laughs> like, yeah, if there's four of us doing it, it's, it is no wonder we're exhausted, you know? And um, how do we get better at making these groups appealing and pulling a lot of people in and not just being mad that people flaked, like, but instead actually creating a culture where people learn how to not flake and learn how, you know, where we explore what procrastination is and where we explore how that feels inside and how we want to talk to each other about getting tasks done and how we know when we need to ask for help and how we, want to talk about something when I said I could do something, but now I can't. And just like actually skilling that up. Um, because and another thing I'll say is that I have had pretty bad burnout at different times in my life because I do have these emotional patterns of overwork and, um, and I've also experienced recovery. And so just believing like, okay, the question becomes like, how do I recover? And like one question that has really helped me that I learned from this group generative somatics that I've done a lot of training with is like, figuring out what a resilience activity is for you versus what's just like escapism. Like we live in a really rough time and there's like a lot of really high quality entertainment, but most of it's pretty draining, like watching TV, playing video games, getting wasted. Like a lot of people like relax in these ways. And I don't, I'm not, I don't think I'm not here to judge that. I fully believe people should do whatever they need to do, but I noticed for myself that those things don't feel very restorative. And that like, it was been, it took a long time for me to be like, oh, I'm going to feel better if I go for a walk than if I like look at a screen more or if I like, you know, like what is actually restorative for me when I'm doing this very hard work that I'm planning to do for the rest of my life during which conditions are going to keep worsening and people I love are going to keep being killed of it. Like, how am I going to fucking sustain? You know, I need to, I, it's probably worth it for me to be like, 
spending time in the garden feels better than spending time on the screen or like taking those drugs or like whatever other things I could do that would be like a quickie way to like zone out my nervous system. So like, I think for a lot of us, it's like, there's this piece around self-accountability around like learning, being, becoming, being interested in becoming emotionally aware enough to see like, okay, my work is trying to heal the world. I also probably have to heal myself like be in a curious healing journey myself to figure out like, how are my behaviors affecting others? How do some of my behaviors affect me? What sustainability is a lot about like, if I create like a lot of drama and conflict in every group I'm in, I'm gonna burn out and I'm probably gonna like also hurt others. Or if I um, am really flaky, or if I um, only know how to relax by getting wasted and then I'm really hungover and I miss my shift at the co-op, you know, like how do we, um, try to become people who could do this work for our entire lives. And it's not about judging ourselves, but it's about like just genuine curiosity about that. And it's not, it's definitely not about judging others. Like I definitely don't want every part of like a scene where people are being judged for using drugs or, you know, that's like our current society, but more just like, let me start with me. Let me start with, and then maybe in our group, we also have conversations about what resilience feels like. And do we want to do resilience activities together? And does making the, like for me, burnout is also about, losing a sense of purpose. Procrastination is also about this. Like if I'm like, just, I can't work on the spreadsheet. I just don't want to, I keep not doing it even though the group really needs me to. And now we're not getting scheduled and whatever. Like, how do I reconnect to what I love about this work and why I care so much about the people I work with and the, and the thing we're doing and then move from there so that I can do a boring task or so that I can, you know, tolerate a meeting in which there's tension or whatever like how do I reconnect to that purpose and I think burnout often feels like I can't even remember why I'm doing this I've lost empathy I feel numb or I feel kind of resentful all the time like what do I need to come back into that alignment um and I think that's an individual question in some ways but when we talk about it together as a group sometimes we get good ideas from each other people are like oh like I have the most fun when we're actually do the out part we do outdoors together on Saturdays or I have the most fun like how do we bring more of the pleasure work together or no, it turns out that when we all like dance or pray or whatever is appropriate to our group culture, like we feel more pumped for this or let's celebrate people's birthdays or like whatever, or what are the things we can put in place as a group that also helps us enjoy this more um, and not be like slogging. Like that's like capitalism has made us have no pleasure in work and feel really alienated when we're working. And then when we go, go to do work we chose that we're not even being paid for, we still feel the same way. Cause like, that's what we're trained to do is like, procrastinate everything and feel evasive of course like yes you should feel you should feel avoidant about your job and capitalism where you're being extracted from that makes perfect sense but if that's the only skill set I have is like to see work as like dull and then to like see like entertainment as shiny like that means like my mind has totally been occupied by those capitalist values and I I can't, I, I've lost, like, actually it's pleasurable to take care of a child or it's pleasurable to work even on a boring task for something I really love. Like, how do I return to that feeling? For me, that's sustainability can only occur if I can tune into that feeling of purpose and pleasure, kind of no matter which task I'm doing in my mutual aid project or whatever. Um, and I've spent a lot of time like feeling really grumpy and evasive of like, oh, I don't want to work on this writing or I don't want to prepare for this class. I'm like, oh my God, I love teaching or whatever. You know, like how to like get back to that feeling. Someone asks, cooperatives are inherently anti-charity and provide structures for survival amidst the capitalist hellscape where mutual aid is not enough. Um, co cooperatives are also not enough though together we'll get there. I'm wondering how we can reinvigorate the cooperative movement solidarity economy within our movements for racial justice and economic justice across the United States with the eventual goal of abolition. Yeah. Yeah, right now, cooperatives and mutual aid are not enough <laughs> because most people have never heard of them. And like, uh, also like for mutual aid, like a lot of times it's like, it pops up during crisis, but if it's not politicized, it doesn't, and if people aren't thinking about how to like get people involved to stay involved forever for the rest of their lives, then it's just like, it's insufficient because it just like pops up for a little while and people are, have conflict or they burn out or, um, or they only thought of it as a COVID thing. They didn't think of it as a like, oh, right. Like we are sustaining through all the disasters forever. You know, they didn't build enough solidarity while they were in it, whatever. They didn't do the political ed piece. Like that's 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 a concern. I've, I've been very curious to see like how long would all the COVID mutual aid projects that popped up, like how, how sustained are they? And I think there's there's actually sustaining more than I expected, which is exciting. But yeah, we need, um, we need a lot more of it, right? We're trying to build an entire society based in, mutual aid and cooperation, in my opinion. We're trying to build a world in which like 
you know, I, I think actually I find Naomi Klein useful for this, like the, her writing about, um, like we want to get to a place where our energy grid doesn't come from, like it's not like run by like some giant company that none of us have any access to. And that's just deciding that we're going to have energy in our homes from like coal or fracking or whatever. Instead, we want like everything run by collective self-determination at a local level that's networked to other people. So we want to be like, oh, we're we're creating, we're, we're making decisions about what energy is like here for this county or for this neighborhood or whatever. And we're doing that together. And we, um, we actually have control and that we want, we want people to have local collective control of like everything of like education, healthcare, childcare, energy, et cetera. Right. And not, um, what we have now, which is that we have a say in almost nothing. And then we have this fake electoral system that tells us our representatives, we vote for people who then don't even do what they said they were going to do. And also who actually can't get anything done unless it's in the interest of capitalism. So, um, so yeah, I think the cooperative and mutual aid stuff is like, um, right now, of course, like nascent and that's not because we're bad and doing it wrong. It's because like everything is lined up against us. Like people have, you know, been fighting to do things in that way forever. And they have been like literally killed for, for it. So yes, like we have, we have actual opponents who make it really hard. Um, and as systems fall apart more, I do think there are more inroads, like like our food system, our energy system, like I, there's just going to be food shortages and blackouts and all of these things more and more. And so the more people can actually know that part of it is like waking people up from their belief that climate change is way far off. Like even people who believe in climate change, I think are really like partly because I think the nonprofits who work on it are supposed to give out good news. Like, you know, if you want funding, you got to give out good news. So people are like, yeah, look, we created this one very minimally useful intervention. Yay. And it's like, oh, good news came. I don't have to worry about climate change today. Not so, right? Um, climate change is not going to be solved by nonprofits or like green corporations or anything. Anyway, to the extent that people wake up to the more of the realities of what we're facing and can do prep work around it. And then some of it's not gonna be prep work. It's just gonna be like when the pandemic came down and people have to respond because it's just like, here it is, right? It's like both those things are happening and you see that all the time with the fires and the storms. People just do mutual aid right then because they have to, but they might've had an easier time or saved each other's lives more if more stuff had been put in place beforehand. Um, but yeah, I think that the way we create these, this level of, of movement is by recruiting, like, you know, like helping, people figure out why they have skin in the game, why, what they're going to get out of it, you know, like you're going to get childcare out of this, or you're going to get, you know, yeah, you need someone to help you fix your roof or whatever. You know, I mean, I just, I just was on this panel with this amazing person, Simi Kang, who was talking about Hurricane Ida. And I didn't, I hadn't heard this because I haven't been in very close touch with people in New Orleans during this time. But Simi was saying that like people on the ground there are saying that like there was even less government response to Ida than there was to Katrina. Like the disaster of Katrina that we're also aware of, like Ida is even worse. Like, pe like FEMA hasn't even given people blue tarps to put over their roofs. And it's been all this time, people have been still getting more and more rained on. I mean, just like it is, there's just no recovery happening for the most part, besides what people are doing through mutual aid. And just like so scary, you know? And I think that when those disasters are like local to somewhere, it's easy for most of us to not see what is not happening. And then it's, I mean, Hurricane Katrina recovery never happened. Like the, all the things are still broken there for that. You know, and that was so many years ago. Jasper asks, how do we collectively steward cooperative housing without falling into the roles of landlord and property manager? Oh, we screen applicants, collect rent, repair and maintain buildings and ask people to leave. Jasper, I love this question. One of my big questions is like with mutual aid projects, how do people not um, actually end up doing the eligibility criteria that is like what charity does where it's like oh yeah we only we're, we're going to let people squat this space and we're going to create it but you have to be sober like you know what I mean or whatever or you have to like we want to create things ultimately where no one is disposable where we really don't like kick people out of, a, of something that they need to survive and like that's really hard which doesn't mean that we do so it doesn't mean that we can't have boundaries it doesn't mean that they that we just allow harm to happen but like we want to create things this is the whole thing with like abolition and the idea of transformative justice like we want to create like when if i'm doing harm like if i'm living in the housing that you guys created and i'm like sexually harassing people like how do we get me to stop doing that how do we create um, you know, some kind of situation where the people who've experienced that harassment from me can feel some kind of healing and safety so they can be in the hallways or the courtyard and not, and not have to be scared, like where there's some kind of like repair and how do we figure out as a whole community, how to not have this happen again? Like, what is it? Is there something about 
Like, do we want to do deep um, workshops all together about toxic masculinity or about sexual liberation? Or like, what do we need so that, that, that I stop doing it? And that also we prevent the likelihood of it continuing to happen. And that we're really responsive when it happens, when people don't deny it or ignore it. And so that like, um, also there's like a resiliency in the whole community because if someone like me is doing this again, like we all have so much shared values around it that I'm less likely to be able to get very far with hurting anybody, you know? Like that's, I think the set of things instead of being like the answer is to just kick me out. We have no idea what else to do, you know? Or when I'm doing some kind of like, I'm, I've got a mental health crisis going on and I'm, it, this, you guys are scared that I'm gonna burn this place down or I've got a drug thing going on or like all of this stuff, which all comes up because we're living in a society full of like traumatized people who've been treated terribly. Um, so yeah, I think, it, I don't think this is easy but I think the, the principles are like, how do we have a non-disposability approach? Um, and so much of the kind of landlord property manager stuff you're describing, what, I don't know if this is what you're thinking of, but what I think of is like that kind of like risk management, like, stuff that's about who's like good enough to live here you know like how do we how do we shift away from that I'm, and not saying that's easy you know it's and it's also I always talk about how this is like imperfect people doing imperfect work it's like we're not gonna like get all this right and perfect but like if we center like there is wisdom coming from different parts of our movements so like if we're doing housing cooperatives and we decide to center disability justice principles and transformative justice principles and processes and read up on everything that's out there for that and like go deep with that, we're better off than if we're in a housing justice and housing cooperatives um, movement that like isn't using those tools that are really heavily being developed by people in other parts, uh, overlapping parts of our movements. So I think that's all we can do is like be rigorous students of whatever the kind of most liberatory thinking and practice models are that are coming out. Um, inside other parts of our like lefty or progressive or whatever spaces. Ian asks, um, Ian says, thinking simultaneously about solving things for the most stigmatized and we're losing, how do we assess where we can actually make some headway versus what a losing battle at our current capacity? Obviously we need to build capacity, but losing battles don't seem to be the best, best way to do that. How do we choose battles without failing, failing solidarity? Yeah. I think, I believe that when it looks like we win, like, but sometimes um, people will be like, oh, it's pragmatic. To, to like leave these people out or like to start with the people who are less stigmatized. And I think that's not pragmatic because the goal, if our goal is to get is to get well-being, when you leave out the more stigmatized people, you strengthen a system that says it's okay to stigmatize. So for example, like in the migrant justice battle, right? Like it's like, if we're just like, we're just gonna try to win for people who don't have a criminal history and who, um, you know, have jobs or something like that, you know, or graduate high school or willing to join the military. These are like typical immigration, um, proposals, you know, it's like what happens is like you see Obama, he does the DACA and DAPA, you know, he, he, he does the, um, those interventions where he's like, oh, people who came in when they were too young and, and then some of their parents, like they're going to have a special pathway to immigration or to not be the targets of immigration enforcement. And in that same legislation, he increases funding for border security and says, we're going to target people with felonies. Like if when it's it's just not pragmatic because it always actually heightens and justifies and legitimizes and materially expands the very system that we are saying is unfair. So I think that thing where like, I agree that we need to be discerning about picking um, different battles, but the discernment should never be based on sort of like who's stigmatized. It's, it's just actually, because it's just actually not pragmatic. Uh, instead, and also they expanded the definitions that allowed someone to be, that allowed a misdemeanor to be considered something that would be, that would mean you were targeted. Like they just keep, you know, so actually they're, they're scooping more people when they let those few people like through the like, you know, relief or whatever. I think instead when I think about losing, so I've been involved in like an eight year fight to stop a new youth jail from being built in Seattle and we lost. Um, and, and, you know, for the first like five years, we couldn't get any of the big nonprofits that say they're for racial justice and immigrant justice and youth justice to sign on. Like it was just like all the, it was like, we were like a ragtag bunch of unpaid people trying to push this huge behemoth of like the nonprofit system and the city and county when everybody's like, but the youth need a new jail. It's going to be a better jail, you know, all the typical things. And we lost, they built it, you know, and we, there was many phases of the, of the, of the process from we were fighting the planning, we were fighting all the zoning, we were fighting, you know, we sued about the environmental issues, we blocked the bulldozers with our bodies, you know, faith leaders, whatever, you know, we did a million things over the course of eight years. We lost, but we changed 
the politics of the county like so deeply like they tried to they was they were in secret plans to build something else like that and they didn't because we had made it such a stigmatized to do things like that and then when the when the uprising popped off the first thing that ca the county executive the mayor of the county did was he announced they were going to close the jail in five years even though it had been open for less than a year like we made this project like uh inroad for changing like race and prison and abolition politics in the counties political we've changed the political landscape so sometimes losing isn't losing you know what I mean? I mean yes we lost and I'm devastated every single time I have to bike by that project as you can imagine but I think what I'm saying is we want to pick battles that change political landscapes because no single battle we're fighting is the whole thing right so we want to pick battles that allow us to center highly stigmatized people to like bring like really radical politics would make them really material on the ground for people like it really like it's a it was a great battle because people could be like yeah i really wish that they would like have better child care and after school programs rather than build another jail for my kids you know right like people get that on a very material like it's a project right here and now it's tied to things they care about and it's got a really good reframe that says why are they spending 230 million dollars on this and it's like brings up these big questions like why do we put kids in jail why do we put anyone in jail does caging work like what is harm you know like that that's what we want is to pick is to political pick politically discerning battles that um where there's a lot of resource on the table or it matters or people understand why it's materially significant and where um it allows us to do framing and so by the end of those eight years like every big nonprofit in the entire county was signed on to our moratorium on jail building platform, you know, but it took, and now when we do our solidarity budget work and our defund work, all those groups are in a totally different place and they're much better allies than they used to be, right? Like we literally move them. Um, and I think that that kind of stuff is like part of how I think about that discernment. I realize we're, we're getting short on time. I'll just do a couple more of these. Um, I got a question in the chat that um, mm -hmm. I wanted to uplift um, on your previous question about, you know, folks uh, sexually assaulting folks and like, how do you deal with that? Um, somebody asked the chat, um, what's the difference between, you know, getting someone to stop sexually harassing people versus the like fixing people model of charity? Um, do, are those the same and what makes them different? That's a great question. Yeah, I, I think the fixing, the fixing people model of charity is about um, blaming um, people in crisis for being in crisis and saying that it's because they they're like that because like crisis is produced by people being bad and the system is ultimately fair. The question of stopping harm in our communities, I think, is just like a really different thing. It's like, oh, this behavior hurts people, and we actually think that this person who's doing it, like, it would benefit them and everyone else if they stopped. Like, the, I think it's like it's actually believing that. Um, yeah, to me, it's not um, it's not about fixing that person. It's about like like having like actually stopping harm like charity models are not about stopping harm at all they're about facilitating the ongoing harm of exploitation exploitation and extraction by blaming people who are harmed for being harmed <laughs> you know what i mean whereas transformative justice models and, and charity models are you know center the decision making of like the government the police the you know and the philanthropists or the rich people um and then like the, their peons like you know lawyers and social workers and whatever like all of us who get paid to like enforce their standards on people in crisis transformative justice is about um acknowledging that harm is really pervasive in our society that policing and imprisonment doesn't address it and actually expands it and is part of it and that what we want is to be able to like have direct, immediate, pragmatic solutions to harm. And the thing that transformative justice does is, is, is we ask those three questions. How can we stop this harm from happening? Um, how can we help the people or person who've been harmed have as much repair as possible? It's You can never make it that it didn't happen, but how can those people like, for example, not be scared to go to the courtyard or not be scared to go to school or whatever, those kinds of things of course make sense um, and how, can we look as a group at like what conditions we all created or are creating that made it likely that this harm could happen, right? So that like what like we also look the other way when this happened, or we all tell sexist jokes, or whatever it is, you know, or we all don't listen to girls, or like whatever the things are that are like the cultural things, or we all ha we have like a way we party in this in this social scene that like really makes this likely, or we have a way we do transportation that makes it really hard for people to get out of the situation or whatever. So like to me that is like deep systemic thinking about people's well-being um that's like about like really pragmatic solutions so it does include yes like we're social beings it's it's okay that we want to influence each other it's okay that we like i i don't think it's fixing to be like oh yeah 
we want to like get men to stop harassing women. <laughs> like, yes, like that's, that is a just principle to be like, yes, we live in a society that encourages people to do certain things or to, um, you know, to, or to hurt each other in particular ways. And we see that that encouragement is often based in lies about how that'll make you more okay. Like you'll feel powerful or you'll, you know, it makes that seem pleasurable or whatever. And we, we believe like, actually it's not good for you or the other person. And, um, and it's okay to do things that are about like influencing you to stop doing that. Like, and that could include like, what do you need to stop harassing people? Oh, it turns out you do it when you're drunk at night and you sit on your porch and do this. Okay. We want to talk to you about like how to shift that. Does that mean that you want to drink less? Does that mean you want to drink, but stay inside? Does that mean like, what, like, what do we need that you would not do this? You know, do you want to have people to hang out with at night when you're drinking and you just feel lonely? And like, so maybe we need to like, maybe we're going to have like chess in the courtyard at night and you can play chess if you want while you drink or whatever, you know, like creative solutions, but like, you know, and also what were you told about talking to people this way that, that it, um, that it's going to be good for you or give you pleasure or benefit you. So like, it's not about, um, like a blanket acceptance of all people as, you know, doing whatever they want. It's about creating social conditions towards liberation and believing that liberation has actual content. Like people shouldn't have to have sex they don't want to have, or people shouldn't have to, um, you know, sleep outside if they don't want to sleep outside or like, like there's actual content to like what, um, and we get to debate that content. We, there's also things we can differ on. That's like a juicy thing in communities. Like, okay, wait, do we think this thing is harm or not? Do we think this is a liberatory way of living or not? Like that's, it doesn't need to be like that there's one clear singular way of that but I think most of us could agree that like sexual harassment in your housing is crappy and it's okay to want it to stop and we can the pe person doing it we can see the person doing it as someone who it has dignity and approach their approach our desire to have them stop with their dignity in mind instead of just like let's get rid of them which I think is like the kind of policing and imprisonment response that most of us have to like shake off or like really revenge oriented is the other thing which like justifies the policing and imprisonment um, framework. So we wanna move away from like having revenge be our point and having like repair and well being be like the ground, the, the fertile ground in which we are like, you know, acting together around harm. I guess we're out of time. Um, so maybe I'll stop. But yeah, I'm really so great to like talk to you all. These questions were incredible and so grateful for what you're all doing um, in your groups and uh, hoping to yeah, stay in touch. <laughs>